Now, I'm not one for clickbait titles, but what's inside this box may surprise you. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. I have done a number of gaming chassis reviews on this channel, but I've never done a bona fide server chassis review, and that's exactly what we have inside of this box. This is the Inwin RS212-02SN. Sorry, my notes are over here, and that's a really long product name to memorize. Anyway, it is a 2U chassis with 12 SAS bays, redundant power supplies, and a whole bunch of other features. So, let's open the box and see what we're working with. Raid card for later. By the way, there's a car alarm going off in the background. I hope you can't hear that. Nice firm foam packing. And there we go. Uh, and by the way, this thing is just as heavy, if not slightly heavier than it looks. Walking around this thing, the most obvious feature is definitely going to be the 12 three and a half inch SAS bays that are up front. And uh, these are pretty well constructed, uh, very, very rigid. I've worked with some drive cages before that just have like two little fingers that run down and you put two screws in the side. Those are kind of a pain in the butt to work with and get right, especially the HP ones, which are multi-piece drive cages. Uh, really happy to see pretty much unibody construction on these. These drive cages all plug into a 12 gig SAS backplane, which we will take a little bit closer look at once we get inside the chassis. Uh, other notable features up front is a single USB 3.0 port, uh, your power and reset buttons, an NMI button, which I'm actually not sure what that does, uh, multiple interface lights for your NIC activity, as well as an amber warning light. Moving around to the back side of the chassis, you can see that this box does support standard ATX motherboards with a full seven expansion slots, although these are of the low profile variety, so keep that in mind when you're building. Uh, there's also dual redundant 550 watt power supplies. I guess dual and redundant mean the same thing, don't they? These are 80 plus platinum units, 550 watts each, so plenty of power for most 2U applications. To get inside of the RS212 chassis, there's a little screw right here on the top plate near the back. And then the two buttons press in and the whole top lifts right off. Inside of the chassis, we have a whole baggie of accessories for ancillary power cables, connectors, screws, and anything else you could ever possibly want for the inside of this. And that's about it as far as the included accessories go. There's not a lot of extra kit that comes with this chassis. You can get some ancillary accessories like a beauty cover to cover the front 12 drive bays, as well as the sliding rail mounts to rack mount this chassis. And you'd be pretty silly not to rack mount this chassis. I don't have my hands on the rail kit today, but fear not if you're interested in it, the guys over at ProClockers.com are going to be reviewing this very chassis as soon as I'm done getting my grubby hands all over it. Uh, I'll put a link down to their website in the video description below. Do go check them out. Damon and the guys do an excellent number of written reviews and deep dives on a variety of subjects. Continuing on with the unboxing, which by the way, I will be doing a full system build inside of this case in this very video. I just wanted to kind of get through the basic specs first. I don't like two part videos any more than you do. The most obvious feature in this case is right up front and it's the 12 gig SAS backplane. It is pre-wired for power to the redundant power supplies with a whole bunch of Molex plugs. And then there are two mini SAS HD connections. Now this is technically a SAS expansion backplane as there are only two mini SAS HD connections. A full line rate backplane would require three mini SAS HD connections. That's really not going to be an issue though, unless you want to load up all 12 bays with full SAS speed SSDs. Right behind the backplane are a trio of hot swappable 80 millimeter fans that provide all of the airflow for this case. They're designed to blow directly over the top of your motherboard and should allow us to run passive heat sinks over the top of our CPUs. The one issue I see from the fan backplane is, well, the cables are only about this long. That's literally all I have to work with. So I am going to have to put in some extension cables or possibly a fan controller to run all of these fans, but that shouldn't really be much of an issue. As far as other connections available inside the RS212, this is your front I.O. cable set with a whole slew of LEDs available for any status indicators you may want to plug into your motherboard. There's also from the other side a USB 3.0 internal header and your reset switch comes out from that side for some reason. Power supply connections are pretty basic, but pretty much everything you need is going to be there. There's your 24 pin motherboard connector. There are two eight pin EPS connectors. Uh, there are some spare Molex connectors if you need them for some reason. There's this weird four pin connector, which I don't know what that's for. It looks like an old CD-ROM analog audio cable. Uh, I'll look that one up. And then there's three SATA power cables for the included two and a half inch drive sleds, which are mounted to the side of the chassis. So what are we going to be putting inside of the RS212 today? Great question, I'm glad you asked. 
The only dual processor board I have on hand that's not currently doing something in my server room is my Hunan Dual X79 board. It's a full EATX board with dual 2011 sockets and a pair of E5 2698 core CPUs. Alongside those 16 cores, I've also got 64 gigabytes of Samsung DDR3 ECC registered memory. Now, this board does work just fine, and it'll be a fine test platform to build inside of the RS-212 today, but I don't recommend you go out and build a system out of one of these anymore. There's a Gigabyte motherboard that's a dual 2011 socket that is only about $10 more, and it's available on Amazon. In fact, I built a system out of that board right up here if you want to take a look. Now, while the Hunan does use a genuine C602 chipset, there's a couple of the features that make the Gigabyte much more appealing, like a much better BIOS, quad-channel memory, and a built-in RAID card. Speaking of RAID card, that's a great segue into what are we using for our hard drive interface today. Courtesy of eBay, I picked up this HP H220 HBA card for about $40. This should give us full access to the front back plane and be able to plug all of our drives in. And speaking of drives, Seagate absolutely hooked us up in that department. Inside of this box here is a pair of 240 gig Ironwolf 110 SSDs and four of their 14 terabyte Ironwolf Enterprise NAS drives. The Ironwolf 110 240 gig SSDs are of the 3D TLC NAND variety. They're rated to have up to 435 terabytes of data written to them over their lifetimes and have a five year warranty and a two million hour mean time between failure rating. The 14 terabyte Ironwolf NAS drives are also very impressive in their own right with a sustained write rating of up to 210 megabytes per second with burst rates going up to six gigabit per second thanks to the 256 megabytes of onboard cache. That's gonna do it for the build list. Let's go ahead and get this thing together. And the build is nearly done. I say nearly done because I did run into a couple of problems that kind of put me at a stopping point for right now. So remember how I said I hate two-part reviews? This is gonna become a two-part review. Sorry about that. I ran into two problems with this build, one of which wound up being a showstopper and does have a little bit to do with the design of this case, but I'll get into that one in a second. The first problem that cropped up was actually the use of the Hunan Dual X79 motherboard. There's no video output on this board, and it took me until I had the build complete and ready to start testing to realize it. Luckily, I was able to track down the only low-profile card that I still own, which is an NVIDIA GT610 from ASUS with a passive heatsink on it. Once I had the video output sorted, I was able to boot it up, and it booted up first try. However, I was immediately met with my second problem, and this one was a little bit more serious, and that was the airflow over the top of my 1U passive heatsinks. The heatsinks, I believe, are manufactured by Silverstone, and I thought being solid blocks of copper, they would be more than enough to keep these CPUs cool. However, the issue really was airflow, regardless of the 4500 RPM of fan that's pointed directly at them. The problem is, again, with this motherboard, with a little bit of a non-standard layout. Uh, there's a VRM heatsink directly behind processor 2, which means it's blocking the bulk of the airflow that would normally get into the fins. The air is actually just passing right over the top of everything. Even just idling inside of the BIOS, the CPUs were sitting between 70 and 75 degrees Celsius, which is just a little bit outside of my comfort range. So I decided to forego the rest of the test and buy a couple of active 2U heatsinks and retry temperature testing again in a couple of days. So the rest of this video is going to focus on the chassis itself, the build process, pros and cons, and really the process of putting a system into it rather than performance data. And again, I'll offer a part two here in a couple of days. 
We're gonna go ahead and start with my thoughts on the unboxing experience. Even though you watched that live, I really wanted to give a couple of bullet points for things that I really did like. First and foremost, this was a classic in one unboxing experience with the individual baggies for every screw and adapter you could ever need inside of this chassis. Every single screw, plate, cable, anything you could need is all individually labeled and individually bagged. And as impressive as that is for a standard in-wind consumer chassis, I'm even more impressed with a server chassis, mainly because there's about 30 bags inside of here with every single part you could ever want for inside of here. Next up, I wanna talk about the hard drive cages again and how easy it was to mount both types of drives. There are native mounts for both three and a half and two and a half inch drives and they both screwed in quite easily. Uh, the three and a half inch drive screws take a standard Phillips number two screwdriver, which was very nice. And that's every single screw inside of this chassis with the exception of the two and a half drives, which require a Phillips number one screwdriver. I'm gonna take a little bit of a half point off from Inwin on this one. I would prefer to see a standard Phillips number two bit on these screws as well. But just like I said in the unboxing, the drive cages are incredibly sturdy, fantastically built, and they are very easy to get in and out of the chassis. I did have a slight bit of trouble getting the system to actually turn on, and that's because the buttons up front here are actually wired incorrectly in my server. The NMI button that I have no idea what it does still is actually labeled power switch on the inside of this chassis. So that caused a little bit of confusion and frustration when I was getting this thing to turn on in the first place. Not really a big deal, more funny than anything else, mainly because it gave me a little bit of a heart palpitation trying to get this server turned on for the first time, worried that I was doing something wrong. But as it turned out, they just flipped a couple of the labels on the switches on the inside. Moving behind the drive cage to the backplane expansion, everything seemed to work absolutely perfectly the first time with my HP H220 SAS card. All of the drives were recognized regardless of what port they were plugged in and everything just seemed to work with no configuration needed. Now again, I haven't done any performance or throughput testing with the backplane, but I will likely do that with a follow-up video. Continuing along our tour of the inside of the chassis and we reach the fans. And oh my gosh, these things are loud. Now I probably should have guessed that this chassis is made for data centers and not necessarily for home closets, mainly based on the price point. This case retails for about $850. Even after the system had posted and the server had the chance to ramp the fans down, these really didn't get that much quieter. And I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who works with servers every single day. These were still louder than I expected. And I might as well slide down a little bit since we're gonna be working with the back half of the chassis now. But first, does this make you nervous? Anyway, cable management wise, I'm really not gonna hold anything against Enwin here, especially because this Hunan motherboard uses really a non-standard layout when it comes to where things plug in at. For example, the 24 pin connector is down here along the side of the motherboard rather than being kept up top with the two eight pin EPS connectors as is pretty standard with a dual socket board. The 24 pin cable really isn't quite long enough to reach where it's at, although it did if I stretched it out just enough. Also the USB 3.0 cable here is bent at a little bit of an odd angle to get to its connector because it's interfering with the SAS card. But I think those are motherboard layout issues and not system layout issues. So again, I'm giving Inwin an entire pass when it comes to cable management. I do like that the backplane came pre-wired with all of the Molex connectors, and they really did seem to think out all of the connectors that you might need in a system like this. For example, they have one spare Molex connector right here up front, and they included a Molex to dual SATA adapter if you wanted to run your dual SSDs inside of the chassis. And in fact, this cable is absolutely the perfect length to do that, and I really appreciate the foresight in little details like that. One thing I will note about the cables themselves is in these bundles, especially with the 24 pin, there seem to be some cables that are quite a bit longer than the rest inside of that bundle. And it makes it really difficult to actually bundle those cables properly and get them routed to where they need to go. I'd prefer to see a little bit better QC in that cable length. The other minor gripe that I had was the fan cable length, and that's that they're not nearly long enough. If you only have an ATX length board in here for a single processor unit, these aren't even gonna reach the screw standoffs for the board, let alone being able to be plugged into them. I was able to use extensions and splitters in my case to get everything connected, but I really would like to see, number one, the cables be longer, or even better, number two, have them all be controlled from an integrated fan controller on this hub and have a single cable lead coming off of this. That way I could control all of the fans in the front of the case from a single fan header on the motherboard. That would make the system so much more streamlined and wouldn't involve so much cable mess in getting everything actually plugged in. 
One nice thing about the fan assembly inside of the RS-212 is if you so desire, you can move the fans back about three inches inside of the case if it fits your needs a little bit better. However, you need to be using a standard ATX size motherboard. Unfortunately, the Hunan motherboard that I'm using today is an EATX size motherboard and it does extend past those final screw points, which means I was not able to move the fans further back in the case. That would have helped my passive heat sinks, although it wouldn't have solved the problem entirely. And what more is there to say? Um, I do have two expansion cards in here, as I said, the HP H220 SAS controller and the NVIDIA GT610 video card. And both of those fit very, very well, very tight tolerances. And that story really continues with the entire chassis. Everything fits exactly the way it should. Every screw screws in exactly right. There's no, there was no fiddling to get anything to fit inside of this case. Really, the only internal complaints that I have are pretty minor, and most of them stem from me using a non-standard motherboard in a case that's designed to be as standard as humanly possible. So overall, I am super impressed with this chassis. If you would like to pick up an Inwin RS-212 chassis for yourself, you actually can buy these on Amazon. And in fact, I will have a link down in the video description below. However, again, I will warn you, these are aimed at data center and professional level customers, not necessarily home enthusiasts, thus the $850 retail price. However, if you're feeling brave enough and your pockets are deep enough, this is one of the nicer chassis I've had my hands on in some time. And in fact, it stands right up there with the standards from HP, Dell, or Supermicro. Standard ATX internals, off-the-shelf compatibility for most other parts, and superb construction all the way around, I would say the Inwin RS-212 is absolutely a great system to build in. That's going to do it for me in this one, guys. Drop me a like if you like this one. I do have one or two more videos coming out on this system before I box it up and ship it across the country to my good friends over at ProClockers, so they can proceed to wipe it down before they take a whole bunch of pretty pictures of it. Anyway, stay tuned for the videos and give them some love as well. Link to ProClockers.com is down in the video description. Make sure to subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already, and follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing. If you'd like to financially back the channel, there are a couple different ways you can do so. First, visit my Amazon store down in the video description for everything you need for your next builder upgrade. Or visit my Patreon, where a minimum donation of $1 gets you access to my exclusive Discord server. As always, thank you guys so much for watching this one, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers, all.